as he speaks through the Apostle John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to him. When we prepare ourselves to come into the upper room, when we prepare to partake in the Lord's Supper, His Holy Communion, we usually confess the Nicene Creed. Sometimes we've done the Creed of Chalcedon. Uh, other times we've sang the Apostles' Creed. But generally, most often, we together confess the Nicene Creed before we come to the upper room and, and, and to the table of the Lord. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is the creed that we confess together? The answer is really simple. We do it because we are Christians. That's the reason. And that's what that creed is about. Before taking the Lord's Supper, which is for professing Christians, we confess the most fundamental doctrine of the Orthodox Catholic Christian faith. Since the early church in 325 first began writing the Nicene Creed till it was completed in 381 at the Council of Constantinople, the church has been confessing this creed, saying this is what makes us Christians. This confession. The church fathers put it together for that very reason, to, to keep the, the heretics away and, and allow the Orthodox, the Catholic Christians, to say, this is what we believe as Christians. If you are a Christian, this is what you must confess. This is your creed. This is your profession, the Nicene Creed. And what is the doctrine that is in the Nicene Creed that they say we must, as Orthodox, Catholic, Christians, believe? What is the doctrine in that wonderful creed? It is the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Now you've noticed that that is what is in the Nicene Creed, right? We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Giver of life. That's what the Nicene Creed is about. It's about the Trinity. It's a triune creed. And all Christians must confess it, if indeed they are Christians. And whereas many things change over the course of time in the history of the church, we're talking about the year 381 to the year 2021, a lot of things have changed since the early days of the church. But all the way since the patristic church, the medieval church, the reformation church, the modern church, and all over the world from Africa to Asia to Eurasia to Australia to Europe to the Americas, the church has always confessed this creed. That's one constant. They've always confessed, we have always confessed this triune creed. And tonight, 
What we have in our Confession of Faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 2, verse 3, is a condensed, tightly packed, brass tacks version of the Nicene Creed. What we have in our Confession of Faith concerning the Holy Trinity is this most Catholic and Orthodox doctrine. Now, I keep saying Catholic. I don't want us to think Roman Catholic. We've talked about this before. Before there was even such thing as a Roman Catholic church, there were Catholics. There was the Catholic Christian faith, the universal faith, all Christians from all times and places. So it doesn't make us Catholic to confess a Catholic creed, especially if it was written in Greek before there was Latin being used in the church, before there was such thing as a pope, before there was such thing as a Roman Catholic church, then we can confess the Catholic faith. Indeed, we are even considered Reformed Catholics. The Reformers said to the the Roman church, you're not even Catholic. We're the true Catholics. You, the Roman, the Western, the Latin, the Popish church, are not Catholics We are. We are Reformed Catholics. We are the true Catholics. That's who we are. So it's okay to say this word and confess this creed. In addition, I keep saying the word Orthodox. And that's not in the sense of the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek-speaking, the Russian-speaking, all those churches. But in the sense that this is the established, approved doctrine of of, of the Holy Trinity. And it has been for almost, get this, 1,600 years. That's a long time. It is the approved, established, true, pure doctrine of the Holy Trinity. And so tonight, that's what we are considering. We are considering, very simply, the Holy Trinity. The wonderful, mysterious, beautiful Holy Trinity. And as we consider the Holy Trinity, we're going to do it in three parts tonight. Three parts. First, we're going to consider the ontological Trinity. Now, don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep yet. I know it's a different word, a word that we probably haven't used before, but it's okay. We'll define it. It'll make more sense soon. First, we'll consider the ontological trinity. Second, the personal properties of the trinity. And third, the economic trinity. The ontological trinity, the personal properties of the trinity, and the economic trinity. And they're all there in in the outline. To help us, okay? So the ontological trinity, the personal property, properties of the trinity, and the economic trinity. Now, again, I know these terms are probably new, but that's okay because guess what? We never stop learning. We never completely arrive and say, well, I know everything I need to know. And so if these are new words, that's okay. It's going to help us to better understand God and the Holy Trinity. And so this is growth. This is how we learn. This is how we grow as Christians. Now let's begin with the ontological trinity. It's a big word, and again, I don't think we've ever talked about it before. And, and I'm not going to apologize because this is how the church talks about the trinity. But it's a new word, so let's define it. What does it mean? Okay, ontos is a Greek word. Remember, most theology was done in the ancient church and throughout church history, either in, in Greek early on, and then as time went on in Latin. So a lot of terms come from other languages. It's okay. Ontos is Greek for being. Being. So it's who he is. Ontos. And logia means logical discourse or logic. So when you put those two words together, ontology, what do you have? You have the study of God's being. Who he is in his essence. Who God is. Ontology is a study of being. So the ontological trinity is a study of the being, the essence of the triune God. The ontological trinity. So the question here is, who is God? God is one in essence. In his being, God is one. Remember that great Jewish creed from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4? The Shema. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. What does that mean? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one 
in his essence, in his being, God is one. And Paul reiterates this point. Ephesians 4, 6, he says, there is one God. So does James. James 2, 19, he says, you believe that God is one. Good. That's a good starting point. That's a really important starting point. And the Nicene Creed makes the same point. Up front, I believe in one God. God, in his being, is one. The Athanasian Creed, I'm not sure if we've, we've used that one before. The Athanasian Creed, that's a creed from either the 5th century or the 7th century. They're, they're not really sure. Uh, it wasn't actually written by Athanasius. Remember, Athanasius was that Orthodox Christian who fought for the Nicene Creed, who fought for Trinitarian, uh, a, a true Trinitarian Nicene theology, orthodoxy. And the Athanasian Creed was written after he died based on his teachings. Okay, it's a beautiful confession of faith. It's wonderful. We'll use it in the future. Uh, but the Athanasian Creed states this. There is but one eternal being. In his essence, God is one. God is one. So that's who God is ontologically. And all the confessions, the Orthodox confessions and scripture say this. God is one. Guess what? He's also three. Uh-oh, I thought you just said God is one. What'd you, what happened? You just said he's one. Well, he is. He's one in his being, in essence. But it's also clear that this one God is a unified three. That's where we get the word triune or trinity. Tri-unity. Triune. Trinity. That's where that word comes from. The Athanasian Creed puts it like this. Now, this is the Catholic faith, that we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity. The unity never confounds the persons nor divides the essence. So he's one being, one in essence, and also he's triune. Logically, it's hard to wrap your mind around these things, isn't it? But God, there is one God who has three co-essential, co-equal persons, the same substance, they're equal in glory and in power, and, and they are deserving of our worship equally. We confess this in the Nicene Creed, and we talked about this both in our ancient church history class and our medieval church history class. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, a very God. And here's the key. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father through whom all things were made. The Son is of the same substance of the Father because they're one in essence. And the creed continues, the Holy Spirit who eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. Is it hard to understand? Is it hard to wrap our minds around? Yeah. But that's who our God is. The triune God is one. As we confessed earlier, in the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, one power, and they are all eternal. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. It's just an archaic way of saying the Holy Spirit. Ontologically, in, in his being, the Trinity is one and three. One God, three co-equal, co-eternal persons. One substance, one essence, triunity. How can this be? I don't understand it. How can God be one and also three? I don't know, but it's biblical. It's in scripture. It's not just in creeds. How can God be one and also three? Well, we, we just heard Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, God is one. And we see that not only in the Old Testament, but we see that in the New Testament. God in his essence is one. But also, biblically, it is clear that God the Father, and this is important. God is one, but God the Father is not God the Son. Nor is he God the Spirit. Right? God is one, yet God the Father is not God the Son, and He's not God the Spirit. And God the Son 
is not God the Father, nor is he God the Spirit. And God the Spirit is not God the Father, nor is he God the Son. So do you see how, it, how it's possible that God is one and also three? Because they're distinct persons. That's how they can be one and also three. The confession, the confession shows us, uh, gives us an example of how they could be one God, yet three. And it points to the baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus. Do you remember who was there at the baptism of Jesus? Jesus comes out of the water. He's baptized by water. And then a voice comes from heaven. The Holy Spirit comes down upon him like a dove and rests on him. And a voice comes from heaven that says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So who's there? God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. How? Don't know. I don't know. But it's there. Sometimes it's okay to say, I don't fully grasp this. Remember we talked before about mystery? This, this is mystery. They're all God, yet they're all distinct, yet there's one God. Our larger catechism, question eight, helpfully puts it like this. Are there more gods than one? There is but one only the living and true God. Well, how many persons are in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one true eternal God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, although distinguished by their personal properties, which we'll get to. Question 11. How does it appear that the Son and the Holy Spirit are God equal with the Father? And the answer, simply put, the Scriptures teach us that the Son and the Holy Ghost are equal to the Father, ascribing unto them names, attributes, works, and worship as are proper to God alone. So in Scripture, we see that God the Son is treated like God. We see that God the Holy Spirit is is God. He's treated as God. He does things that God does. But we also see that they are not the Father. Think of creation. Who was there? Who was there at creation? Well, obviously God the Father, the one who created all things by the word of his power. He spoke and it was. But who else is there? Who's hovering over the face of the deep, waiting for that word, create? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep, waiting for the Father to say, create, go. John tells us who else was there at creation. The Word. Who's, the, who's this Word? Who's this Logos? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. He was, he was with God in the beginning. Nothing that has been made was not made through him. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's amazing. The only son from the father, the word, has become flesh. So who is present at creation? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Godhead, the triune God. Also, consider the benediction that we usually use in the evening service. The benediction from 2 Corinthians, it's at the very end of 2 Corinthians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Three distinct persons, yet one in being, one in essence, and God is placing them on us. It's amazing. Think of the Great Commission. What does Jesus tell the church? He says, baptize in the name of the Father. Have a nice day. No. Baptize in the name of the Father and the Son, have a nice day? Nope. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are co-equal. Not three gods. One God. The Athanasian Creed again. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, so the Catholic faith forbids us to say that there are three gods or three lords. One God. These are simple facts, beloved. Does that mean it's easy for us to grasp? I hope not. There's true mystery in this. Dr. Van Dixhorn writes, 
everyone agrees that the revelation of one God, who is three persons, is hard to understand and impossible to fully explain. Okay? He says, everyone agrees that the revelation of one God who is three persons is hard to understand and impossible to fully explain. So if you're having a difficult time grasping it, it's not because I'm bad at explaining things. Everyone's bad at explaining this. This is very difficult. I think that's, that's comforting when he says that. It's difficult to, to explain. Thank you, Dr. Van Dixhorn. I appreciate that. Remember when we first began our series on chapter 2 of God and we were going through all these attributes? Remember that? Before we got to the Holy Trinity? I used to wonder, why is Holy Trinity the third point in this paragraph? Shouldn't he be first? But I, now I understand why the Westminster Divine started with all of God's attributes. Here's why. This is what I think. I think they wanted us to feel small when we got to the Trinity. I think they wanted to humble us with the amazing attributes of God. They wanted us to be humbled by those first two paragraphs, all those details, so that when we'd get to this paragraph, we'd say, uh, I don't understand, but it's okay now. I understand that it's okay that I don't understand. So before they, they hit us with the simple yet profound, hard to wrap our minds around truth of the Trinity, they wanted us to understand that God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, goodness, justice, and truth. Yeah, that God. Be humbled by him. Then you get to this doctrine of the Trinity and you say, I don't really understand. But you know what? At this point, after the first two paragraphs, it's okay that I don't get it. They wanted us to be in awe. And that's what the Holy Trinity should do. As we meditate on the mystery of the Holy Trinity, we should be in awe. The ontological Trinity. In the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons, one triune God in unity, Trinity in unity. Now we consider the personal properties of the Godhead, the personal properties of the Godhead. Another way to think about this is just ask the question, what is different about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? What makes the persons of the triune God unique or distinct What's distinct about them? Now, we know that the Father isn't the Son. That much is clear, right? And we know that the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father nor the Son. We agree on that. But there is actually an orthodox way of thinking about the distinctions that is their personal properties. This is the only question I received uh, on the floor of Presbytery when I was licensed. This is the only question on the Trinity that I had to answer. Here's the question. This is personal properties, okay? What are the personal properties of the three persons in the Godhead? What are the personal properties? What makes them distinct in the Godhead? Okay? Here's the answer. It is proper to the Father to beget the Son. And to the Son to be begotten of the Father. And to the Holy Ghost to proceed from the Father and the Son from all eternity. Now, when I said that answer on the floor of Presbytery, one of my professors corrected me, and he said, did you say preceding or proceeding? Because it's a big difference. <laughs> and I said, oh, I said proceeding. And he says, that's what I thought you said. So what does this mean? It means the Father is eternal, not begotten at all. It means the Son is eternally proceeding from the Father. He's eternally begotten. And the Spirit is eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Now, based on what we just heard about them being co-eternal, same substance, same power, equal in all things, equal in glory, would you say that the Father and the Son are equal? Or would you say that the Son is down there and the Father's up here? Would you say that the Son is subordinate to the Father? What would you say? Well, just in case you ever hear this, here's the answer. The Son is not lesser, nor is he subordinate 
to the Father. He is eternally begotten, equal in glory, power, and essence. The Athanasian puts it like this. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten from anyone. The Son was neither made nor created. He was begotten from the Father alone. The Holy Spirit was neither made nor created nor begotten. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. None in this trinity is before or after. None is greater or smaller. In their entirety, the three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with each other. So important. So important. None in this trinity is before or after None is greater or smaller in their entirety. The three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with each other. I would recommend just taking the Athanasian Creed and reading it. Just meditate on it. It, it would be a great benefit for the church if we did this. In fact, we may start mixing it into one of the things that we confess. It can only be good for us. So how do we know that the Father is eternal? And that he was not created nor begotten from anyone. Think about it this way. What's his name? Yahweh. What does Yahweh mean? I am. I was, I am, and I always will be. In other words, it's talking about his eternity, right? He always was. There was never a time when he was not. He invented time. Before there was time, he was there. Before anything existed, he was there. Eternal means he existed from eternity past, not just eternity future. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God, he was already there. No one created him. He's eternal. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Nothing existed until he spoke. Remember the discussion that he had with Job? Okay, Job, you want to take me to trial? You're, up, you're unhappy with the way I do things? Uh, just let me ask you a quick question before you take me to trial. Uh, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? What are its measurements? I, I forgot. Can you remind me of the measurements of the universe? Uh, where is the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness? Surely you know. You were there, right, Job? You're a smart guy. Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you send forth lightning? Do you know how many clouds there are? And then Job's like, oh, yeah. Oops. And he covers his mouth. Job remembers, you're eternal, and I'm finite. I'll stop speaking now. God the Father is not created, nor begotten, but eternal. And how do we know that the Son is eternally begotten? Consider once again the opening of the Gospel of John. John is huge when it comes to the Trinity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So go back to Genesis 1. In the beginning was God. Who else was there? The Word. God the Son. Verse 18. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. The Son was always there. The only one who has seen God the Father fully is God the Son who is at the Father's side. Since, since when? Since forever, since eternity past, since the beginning, before anything that now exists was in existence, he was there. As the Nicenes, remember the Nicenes were the Orthodox Christians, and they sang against the Arians. The Arians went around saying, there was when he was not, talking about the Son. There was when he was not. Remember that? We talked about that. They wanted everyone to think that there was a time when the Son didn't exist. So that was their little ditty that they sang. And the Nicenes sang this song. There never was when he was not. There never was when he was not. It's true. There was never a time when he was not. Consider John 17, 4. Jesus' high priestly prayer. Go meditate on that, by the way. John 17. Jesus says, I glorified you on earth. He's speaking to the Father. He says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. That's amazing. 
Did you hear that? Father, glorify me now in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Wow. And that's the one who died for our sins? We don't deserve that. From eternity past, the Son was there, eternally begotten. And how do we know the Spirit is eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son? Well, who was there at the beginning with God, hovering over the face of the deep, waiting for God to say, create? Who was there? The Spirit of God. Jesus says this about the Spirit in John 14, 16. I will ask of the Father, and he will give you an advocate to be with you, the Spirit of truth. So this is showing that the Spirit proceedeth from the Father and the Son. John 14, or excuse me, 1426, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. John 15, 26, when the Spirit, the advocate, the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Jesus is going to send the Spirit. When does the Spirit come? After the ascension and enthronement of Christ, he's poured out on the church. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. What are the personal properties of the three persons? It is proper to the Father to beget the Son, and to the Son to be begotten of the Father and the Holy Ghost to proceed from the Father and the Son from all eternity. We've considered the ontological trinity. We've considered the personal properties of the triune God. And now we consider the economic trinity. Now this doesn't have to do at all with the stock market or money. This has to do with a Greek word, or oikonomios, which means household management. You've ever seen the yogurt called oikos? I always thought that was weird because in Greek that means house. I don't know why they chose that for their name, but they did. So it means household management. Economy, the word economy comes from the Greek word oikonomios, which means household management. So the economic trinity is about the work that the triune God does. What work does the triune God do? Well, first of all, he works at creation, doesn't he? Creation was a triune act. Of the triune God. We've discussed this already. God the Father decrees through the Son and the Spirit creates. Consider the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of all things, visible and invisible. And then in John 1 and uh, Hebrews 1, we see that all things were created through the Son. And the Son upholds all things. And of the Spirit, we confess, He is the Lord and giver of life. The one who hovered over the face of the deep. So creation was an act of the triune God. Well, the economic trinity also refers to something else. Our salvation, our redemption. That is a work of the triune God. Did you know that the, the act of redemption, us being redeemed, that is a work of the triune God? All three persons are working together in it? From eternity past, God the Father willed he covenanted with the Son in this work of redemption. That this work must be done to save the elect. God the Father decreed it. He willed that the Son would do the work of redemption to save the elect from their sin. To redeem the elect. What is the work that the Son agreed to do according to the will of the Father? The incarnation. Live under the law. Suffer. Go to the cross and die. And he would be rewarded upon doing that work by the Father who raised him from the dead and brought him into heaven and seated him on his throne and gave him a kingdom and a people. And then the Holy Spirit applies the benefits of redemption that Christ earned according to the will of the Father to the elect. What's that called? We talk about it all the time, the order of salutis, the order of salvation, effectually calling us into Christ, giving us a new heart, a new life, converting us, justifying us, adopting us, 
sanctifying us throughout this life, persevering us until we are brought into the triune God's presence, glorification. This entire thing, all of this is a work of the triune God. They're doing it together. Listen to this. Here is a definition of what we call, by the way, what is this called? You've heard it before. You know what it's called. It's the covenant of redemption. It's the covenant of redemption. Here is a definition of it. This comes from Michael Brown and Zach Keel. The covenant of redemption is the covenant established in eternity between the Father who gives the Son to be the Redeemer of the elect and requires of Him the conditions for their redemption. That's the work of Christ, the humiliation of Christ. And the Son who voluntarily agrees, that's important, who voluntarily agrees to fulfill these conditions and the Spirit who voluntarily applies the work of the Son to the elect. That is the covenant of redemption. It is a work of the triune God. God the Father decrees it. He wills it. The Son agrees. The Spirit applies it. Remember John 17. John 17, it's such an important passage. You've got to read this whole chapter. I'm only going to read a verse or two, but listen to this. Jesus says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work of, that you gave me to do. So the son is speaking to the father. I've done the work. And he's about to go to the cross and he's about to be raised and ascended. He says, I've done the work. Now, father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Beloved, that's who has saved you from your sin. The one who existed before time existed. Think about that. That's awesome. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. The elect. He's not saving the non-elect. He's saving the elect. The ones who God gave him. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. All mine are yours. And you are mine. And I am glorified in them. I am no longer going to be in the world. They are in the world. I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. He's talking the work that he has to do is the work that he has agreed to do according to the will of the Father, coming and saving the elect from their sin. And then he ascends back to the Father, which is where he belongs, according to who he is, God. This is the covenant of redemption. This is the work of the triune God, the economic trinity. I think it helps us to to end with the economic trinity because it helps us to understand that the doctrine of the trinity is not some far off abstract ivory tower doctrine but it touches us the trinity matters to us because the trinity is the one who has saved us from our sins that's awesome when you think about it What's better than that? That God, the eternal, has come in the flesh, lived among us, and has saved us from our sin. And then ascended into heaven and given us the Spirit, and the Spirit applies His work to us. So the Trinity is not just a bunch of big words, abstract stuff. It touches us here and now. This is the God who saves us. This is the God who dwells in us. Each of the persons carrying out important purposes to save sinners like us. Thanks be to God for the ontological trinity. God as he is in his being. Thanks be to God for the personal properties of the trinity. The distinct persons and the who they are. And thanks be to God for the economic trinity. Although the trinity may be mysterious and very difficult to wrap our minds around. We have proof of the triune God in our own lives. That's awesome. Insofar as we have been redeemed from our sins, we have the work of the triune God in our own lives. Praise be to God for the Holy Trinity.